So I think it's generally well acknowledged that um, water, drinkable water, is a bit of a problem out of the entire Earth. Apparently only about 3% of the water is drinkable and that kind of number's pretty scary if you think about it. Now, if you don't think there's a global water problem, then just ask the people in Michigan, Flint, or California, or Texas how their water's going. This is seen as a global problem, but interestingly enough, it's a global problem with local solutions, because every area differs, of course. Now, it boils down to a number of things. Basically, how we use water, how we recycle water, and how we're going to generate new water sources. And you might think, well, generate new water sources, how are you going to do that? It's just random rivers. But apparently, the air around you contains six times more water than all of the rivers in the world. I found that fascinating. And in the UK, the average humidity is at 90% humidity at a high and 70% humidity at a low. That's the UK. But humidity can drop quite a lot lower than that, but it doesn't matter. We can pull that water out of the air, and it's called atmospheric water generation. And it's not new. This is something the Incas were doing centuries ago. They sustained their entire civilization with something called fog catchers. They're basically nets they hang up over the sea fog and collect the water and drip it into systems and run their entire irrigation system from that for hundreds of years. And they're still using it. Peru, which sits in uh, a desert area really, and Lima's in a volcano, one of the driest cities in the world, suffers no water shortage at all because they use fog catchers to collect all their water. Now, it's supposed that this idea was inspired by the Stenocara beetle, a beetle found in South America and lots of deserts, the Namib Desert, for instance. Then basically what it does is clambers on the top of the dune, sticks its backside in the air and waits for the fog to roll over. When the fog rolls over, it collects on the back, runs down a little channel straight to its mouth and it gets itself a drink, able to drink 12% of its body weight in any particular day. And of course, this has inspired an awful lot of research into the nature of surfaces and how you might go around collecting water. And those, that surface research has led to the superhydrophobic materials channeling water droplets into collection points. Now, that style of collecting water or generating water from the atmosphere is a condensation style. You just wait for the water to drop below its dew point, it will collect in some form or other, and then you can pull it together and use it. Now, fog nets aren't the only thing. <laughs> there is such a thing as air wells. Air wells are um, at their best passive structures. They're just buildings that encourage this dew point formation and the water is collected from there. That condensation is also used in things like dehumidifiers and other water collectors where you drop the temperature below the dew point and the air that you're forcing over that, it's a bit like a fridge in reverse, collects in a tray and it forms perfectly drinkable water. This is a method that Beth Koeji is using in Kenya. She's using that kind of reverse air conditioner, sort of fridge, kind of condensation way of generating water in schools in Kenya. Condensation methods are brilliant when you have a temperature of about 18 degrees centigrade and you've got more than 30% of water, then they're just fantastic ways of collecting water from the atmosphere. You can even use a Peltier device to run something like that. I mean, it would be pretty energy intensive, but what it sort of gives up for in terms of energy you get because of portability. And there is a product out now called the Self-Refilling Water Bottle, where it's basically a sheet with a water bottle underneath it, and it collects water in exactly the same way. And you're finding these condensation um, methodologies being put in place all over the place, including air wells now being constructed in India, along with solar-driven condensers. It is an astonishingly active area, but it is only one half of the coin, and that is absorption. Now, lots of materials will absorb water just by their very nature. You can buy these things in the UK. The air just floats over them, really, and they suck the water out of the air. This is calcium chloride. 
But a lot of materials will do that. So things like zeolite, for instance, silica gel, which you find as the uh, drying agent in lots and lots of electronics that you buy, will all do that job. I mean, they're passive when they're like this, but if we force the air through them, of course, we aren't talking about a few drops of water that a dry tongue may want to lick off a leaf. We're talking about litres of water and of course this is an extremely hot topic in research with the US military heavily involved in it through DARPA because they're looking for systems that can provide water say for 150 soldiers all day long and yet be carried by two or three men and they came up with a gel that's a mix of um, cellulose and a gum called konjac gum the performance of that material is unbelievable. At 30% humidity, it will produce 15 litres per kilo of gel per day. At 15% uh, humidity, which is more or less desert conditions, it'll produce 6 litres of water per kilo per day. This is a huge amount of water. Of course, with these things, once you've absorbed all of that water, you of course have to get it back out. And getting it back out is a, a methodology of drying it. And there is a lot of ways to dry this thing. If you're short of uh, on-grid power and you can't use drying, then obviously you just stick it in the sun with a plastic sheet over it and the sun will dry it for you and that water can be reclaimed relatively easily. Absorption agents don't only have to be solid like this, they can also be liquid. So brine, for example, is a brilliant absorption agent. And if you effectively drip that down a tower, what it will do is suck the water right out of the air. And then, of course, you can concentrate that brine by removing the pure water. Of course, that is very closely related to desalination. So it is another huge area of research interest that is active and developing at a rate of knots. But that process of pulling water straight out of the air seems almost magical, really. And I agree with Beth Koji, who called her system magic water. She spelt it slightly different, M-A-J-I-K, -A -A I believe. Um, is a really a good name because there's just something fantastical about it. Now it's hard to believe that there is so much water in the air, but here in the UK we have an average high of 90% humidity and an average low of 70% humidity. And all over the world there are various fogs and mists and humidity conditions right down as far as 15% humidity, where pulling water from the air as if by magic is actually extremely doable in litre amounts, not pipette worth. Anyway, I thought I would share that with you because in 2022 there was that announcement, which is this year obviously, of that new high-performing gel. It just struck interest that this issue of um, water scarcity is an issue that we look like we're going to be able to solve. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching and please do remember to like and subscribe.